Thank you, Mike, and thank you, uh, Barry, for inviting me here. Um, you listen to these controversies, and you think we're all real mortal enemies here, but uh, actually, um, I would like to see they just pick the topic, but then switch the talk uh, so that you will hear uh, very similar discussions. Um, and actually, Dimitri started another controversy. Uh, don't believe that the retroperitoneal is the way to go for adrenal cortical cancer. That's completely wrong, but we'll, we'll debate that another day. So um, the trouble with adrenal cortical cancer is that it's actually quite rare, two per million per year. In the city of San Francisco, you'll find one and a half each year. So for you to get experience in that, it's actually pretty, um, uh, very difficult. And uh, I want you to concentrate on the, the data that these patients have very bad prognosis. Uh, even with an operation, uh, the five-year survival uh, is uh, less than 50%. And another number I want you to concentrate, concentrate on is the fact that 20% of these patients have margin positive resection. That's going to be the key of the talk, margin positive resections. Now, this is uh, the standard uh, uh, staging that uh, Dimitri has already shown you about stage one and two, which is five centimeter bigger or smaller. Any kind of nodal or local invasion will be stage three, and then obviously distant metastasis is stage four. If you look at this uh, very extensive evaluation of uh, what happened to patients with adrenal cortical cancer in the national uh, database, you see that, as it turns out, the tumor size really isn't the most important thing. Nodal metastasis, distant metastasis, tumor grade, and look at that, the margin status, if you have an R0 resection versus an R2 resection, meaning you left tumor behind, even if you have R1 resection, microscopic tumor behind, the patient's prognosis is tremendously influenced by that. Uh, here's a, another single institution slide that show you the, the uh, survival curve is completely different for one that you can resect completely and one that you have not resected completely. If you don't resect that cancer completely, that patient is dead and dead very soon. So let's look at the debate, and I was very glad that Mike actually changed it from four centimeter to seven centimeter, but I, I could change that number back to four centimeter too, and we can still go through the same argument. The questions are, first of all, how likely is this a cancer? Secondly, is that what are the differences in operative morbidity for these? And third will be what are the differences in the oncological outcome? First of all, how likely is this seven centimeter lesion being a cancer? And uh, there are multiple studies already, like this is an ROC curve that shows that the bigger the tumor is, the more likely that you'll be a cancer. Uh, here's another uh, bar curve that shows uh, from the NIH uh, consensus data. Uh, when the tumor goes to six centimeters, 25% of those are already uh, cancerous. And in fact, I was very glad that Demetrius brought that up about his own study. Uh, he was the first one that pointed out to us that what the CT scan shows is very different than what uh, the pathology shows. So there's an egg, ostrich egg on the side. What the CT scan show is never the longest diameter. Plus, once you take out the tumor, you put it on the table, it gets even bigger. So this seven centimeter lesion, now I can make it up to about 8.5 centimeters. So I'm really in the winning uh, uh, column now. So, how likely is this a cancer? Let's say that it's very likely. So what about the differences in operative morbidity? Now, I'm a Sages and I'm a Sages member, so I had to concede, this one I won't argue, that open definitely have more short-term morbidity, okay? But keep in mind that if this lesion is seven and, seven and a half, eight centimeter, eight and a half lesion, you still have to take it out whole. So no matter what you do, you can use needoscopic approach. You can use whatever. You got to make at least the same size incision. So now that morbidity advantages is not necessarily as big as you would think, not like a lab coli versus an open coli. So I minimize a little bit about the 
operative morbidity advantage of laparoscopic procedure. But now I want to talk to you about the oncological disadvantage of laparoscopic procedure. So what's the oncological outcome and what does the literature show? So uh, Dimitri already told you about this is Bob Miller's paper uh, from uh, Michigan, which he also updated. If you look at the difference between laparoscopic and open approach, the difference there is that the positive margin rate for the open approach is 20%, 18%, pretty much similar to what you saw in that uh, uh, national data. The laparoscopic approach, 50% margin positive. That is not acceptable. The other problem is that those that recurred, the laparoscopic ones recurred in 10 months versus the open one that recurred in 20 months. So the disease-free interval is very different. But the key thing is margin positive. And here's another one that they broke it down into uh, three different size groups. And in fact, it turns out that it actually doesn't really matter what size it is, that the margin positivity is way higher for laparoscopic resection. Now, uh, this is actually uh, Bruno Canai's uh, overall review of analysis of the literature. And it is uh, reasonably uh, uh, believed that there's no level A ev uh, evidence. That is, there's nothing in the literature of prospective randomized study. Even all of the stuff that Dimitri showed you were at best level B uh, type evidence. And in this review, they agree that local recurrence is increased and the recurrences are earlier uh, when you do these things laparoscopically. And in fact, there's one paper that they use in this review that I did not show you here. It's related to how many adrenolectomies you have done for cancer. So the difference there is if you do more than 10, you have a good chance of leaving your margin uh, not positive. If you do less than 10, you have a good chance of having positive margin. Now, I don't know how many people in this audience have done more than 10 laparoscopic adrenolectomies for adrenal cortical cancer. Remember, two per million per year. Okay, so because of that, the NCCN guideline, if you look at the NCCN guideline for all cancer centers, if you have an adrenal cortical cancer or highly suspicious adrenal cortical cancer, the recommendation is open resection. Okay. Now let's let's look at some other questions. Well, wh why don't I just reoperate if the cancer recurs? Well, this is what the data shows. If you don't do it right the first time, you got to repeat it. That's what the survival curve looks. Basically, the patient will be dead very fast. Well. Uh, well, let's talk about lymphadenectomy uh, because when we, when we do laparoscopic adrenalectomies, we usually don't go ahead and do the lymph nodes. And I'm very glad that Dimitri showed the German study because he obviously put a lot of credence in this study. Well, the German uh, group just published their new study and compared those with lymph node dissections and those that without lymph node dissection. And guess what? There's a survival difference if you do a lymph node dissection on these patients. Now that's the problem, okay? Because not only you have to keep margin not positive, you got to dissect out the lymph nodes. Now let's limit it to the stage three patient that we have here. The difference is still there. So now you gotta do lymph node dissection, okay? And in fact, this is the extent of lymph node dissection you have to do. You don't have to take out the kidney, but you gotta take out those lymph nodes. Okay? So, well, another argument. Well, why don't I just start laparoscopically? And then since it's only about, you know, 30% chance, 40% chance, maybe a cancer, I'll just do it laparoscopically. And if I think it's a cancer, I convert. The same German study now, they did 35 laparoscopic adrenalectomy, and 12 of them were converted to open. So first of all, uh, only two-thirds of them continue laparoscopically. But look at the number. Out of the 12 conversion, the only conversion that occurred was because of intraoperative recognition or malignancy, meaning that you have trouble telling in the operating room whether something is a cancer or not. In fact, it is even 
difficult to tell whether it is a cancer or not after the operation. And that's why we have something called a WISE criteria, where the pathologists look through all of these with nine criteria and decide whether or not something is a cancer or not. So here's a problem. You can't tell. You can just say, oh, I start laparoscopically, and if it's a cancer, let's do it. So let's go through the three questions. How likely is a seven centimeter lesion a cancer? Very likely. What are the difference in operative morbidity? I can see open has more short-term morbidity, but we do a lot of big operations all the time. And even if you do it laparoscopic, you still have to make a, at least a seven centimeter incision to get rid of this tumor and all the lymph nodes. What about the difference in the oncological outcome? You are more likely to achieve an R0 complete resection if you do this case open, okay? Now, open resection is the procedure of choice for this seven centimeter uh, resection because it is likely <coughs> to be larger than seven centimeter just by Dimitri's uh, rule. Intraoperative recognition of cancer is more difficult. Open is more likely to achieve R0 resection and open has an option for lymphadenectomy. So as uh, this other San Franciscan in 1971 said, that this is a San Francisco Police Department inspector named uh, Harry Callahan. Uh, he talked to this crook who uh, is in front of him and basically asked him that, uh, do you think I have used up six shots or five shots? And the question is, you got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Thank you very much. <laughs>